Um, okay, hello everyone and welcome to our second online teaching hangout. I'm here with uh, academics and students and teachers from around the world, I guess, <laughs> to talk about online teaching and how, how uh, best tips, best practices, and how to just kind of get through it. Okay, so um, uh, maybe we, introductions are in order, so maybe everyone can give a quick 30 second introduction. Um, my name is uh, Jason Ko. I teach at the University of Hong Kong. And um, yeah, that's me. Who would like to go next? Don't be shy. Can I go? I'm, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm co-host, so I'll go next. Okay. And also at University of Hong Kong. Um, I'm Alex Watson. I'm at Meiji University in Tokyo. Um, so we have been on break since March. Mm. And we're looking to start up probably late April, early May with um, <clears throat> digital teaching. So I'm really interested to hear your general experiences and also obviously how this impacts the students because this is a completely unknown world for us. So thank you. Okay, who's next? Yep, Albert from the Faculty of Arts um, at the University of Hong Kong and I'm actually in the uh, Center for um, Applied English Studies. Hi, I'm Alvin um, from Camlet HKU. I'm uh, Gina and Jason's colleagues. Um, I'm Valerie So is, from San Francisco. Oh. No, it's my turn, Grace. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. No. <laughs> Great, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm Valerie So from San Francisco, and I teach at San Francisco State and Asian American Studies. Um, and my name is Grace Wang, and I'm at the University of California at Davis and in, in the American Studies program. Oh, department. We are department. Wow. Oh, we have been for a few years. <laughs> okay, so I'll go last. I'm Sharon. I'm currently an undergraduate student. I'm, do I'm a fourth year um, in the law and literature double degree program, and I have one more year to go, so this is my penultimate year. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. All right, so um, let's start with uh, Sharon and Albert because they have to run first. So uh, any questions or uh, advice or things you want to talk about? Either of you. Could I just really quickly ask Sharon how she feels as a student, things have been going from the student point of view. Has, have you had enough bandwidth? Have you had a place to study that's been okay? And what have you been hearing from the other students? Have they been okay with bandwidth and with place to study or home conditions, that kind of stuff. Definitely. Uh, great question. Super, super wide. I can probably go on about this, but Please I do. think just to pinpoint and try to be as concise as possible. Um, I think we all acknowledge that this is a very difficult time for everyone, including professors. And, um, but in a, in a way, I think we are all like struggling a bit. Like personally, if I am allowed to say that, I am like quite serious about my studies and I've been on the Dean's list and I try to be very serious about what I do and how I do it. But this has been a very difficult period for me personally and for a lot of other students. And I think I'm trying to, I haven't really like tried to list it out, but then I think to verbalize why, I think one of the first reasons is that in the beginning, there were a lot of changes. And I think, you know, you like, especially for me, I've been sort of an undergrad for so many for four years right so like I have like a way of like operating how I learn and stuff like that and like, it's initially set in one mindset and then there are one change and we adapt to it but then sometimes there are multiple changes so I've realized and I don't mean to call out like colleagues in the faculty of arts but I've realized that changes tend to happen more within the faculty of arts which is great because in a way you guys are adapting and listening to our feedback um and it's actually been great because I for a couple of my courses, they've changed so much for the better in the Faculty of Arts. But then the Faculty of Law, we, we literally have no say. Like, like the course just goes as it was before, just like transcribed online. So there have been no changes at all for most of my law courses. For my um, like peers in the Faculty of Law, this has been great because like there's no need to adapt to any new things, right? We just like go as we would normally. So it's like the same lectures at the same time, just recorded, um, but they have not asked us if things are okay, which sometimes, at least for me, is very tough because like, um, I think I may possibly, and I'm not sure if I do, but like, anyway, so like, I think I might be like ADHD, which has never been an issue for me in my in the past. And I have not been diagnosed properly or at all. So this is a sort of like shot in the dark, but someone has mentioned to me 
that I might have this problem. And I've never known that this is an issue until like recently when like there's no structure in my life and I can just be like hyper focused on anything I want, right? So like I can be like, I'm very artistic in a way. So I like doing music and, and stuff like that. So when there's suddenly no structure, it becomes really difficult for, I guess, like students like me. And so there are good things and bad things to having changes and structure and also bad things that come from like the lack of structure. I'm not sure if that was clear. Please, cl please ask me to clarify if that wasn't specific. Oh, absolutely. That's very, very clear. So I guess right now you're the, you're the subject and we're all the researchers. So please tell us more. How can we make it better for you and your classmates to do well? And for me, one of the biggest hard, the hardest things is like, you know, okay, Sharon, you're obviously a stellar student, right? So for me, it's like, how do I make sure that my stellar students can learn as much as they possibly can? In this in this time and situation but how do i make sure that other students who need structure and need it don't get left behind right. so what do you think are the best practices what has worked what hasn't worked sure that's, and that's that's a very good guiding question i i have to like so i am actually in alvin's class right now and like alvin has been amazing in like being very you know responsive to feedback so essentially like yesterday i emailed him and like you know he responded very quickly to my concerns and it actually feels great to know that professors care like just knowing that you know sometimes i think for students it's like for us we can feel like oh you know we don't matter to you because like we're just one in like a class of like 50. but then if we hear back from you really quickly and like just like hear that you actually are listening to us i think does already on its own an amazing job so i think one thing would be, you know, great is that maybe you can send an email out to your students and just go like, you know, we are here and we care for you. And I think that's something that I find most, most professors in the Faculty of Arts do this really, really well. And I wonder if it's like a discipline thing, you know, just like sort of a joke. I'm not that the Faculty of Law professors don't care, you know, so it is important, I think, to make your time available and just let people know that they can come to you for problems in the class or maybe even in personal life. Um, so I, I think like to an extent, you guys can also like, act, maybe not true. I, I was gonna say that you can trust that we can tell you that if there is an issue, but I acknowledge that that's not the way everyone works. Like I do that, if there's a problem, I'll be like, I'm sorry, I think there's a problem with like Zoom or like with certain recordings, but I think in a, in a way I'm quite rare in that I am very okay with like voicing out feedback and not take that as a complaint. Um, I was gonna say something else. Oh, and I think like one of the issues that I think most professors seem to struggle with across like, so I'm doing six courses, the regular load is five. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so like the thing, I might drop it. I don't even know. Anyway, so like, I think um, a consistency that I'm seeing is that, you know, professors tend to, I think overthink even on like technical stuff. It's like, I, I understand that like, you know, some professors are like, they think that they're not tech savvy but honestly like i don't think we really like mind if there has if there is slip up in a way that in terms of like use of zoom like right and like mm -hmm. i realize that you know sometimes professors are very cautious or like careful against like accepting technical change but i think maybe perhaps it would help for you to understand that you know we are quite tech savvy and like if there is an issue we can we can and we will offer to help if we can but like and Zoom as a platform has been amazing. Like classes with Zoom that are live are so much better than classes that are not. And this is something that I've actually talked about with my peers because like we have, I forget if it's Pimento, like the lecture recorded one and then Zoom and two platforms. I forget what that other platform and is called. Pimento. Yeah, so honestly like that is not good. Like I, it's way better to have like you know, a time where I'm like, for these two hours, I will be sitting here and I will have interaction, mm -hmm. right? It's like really bad if everything was like not interactive at all. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who is very extroverted. Like I can do like five meetings back to back and I won't be tired. I don't really need alone time and me time. So for me, especially not having like live interactions is really difficult. Obviously for some students, like some of my peers are very introverted and they're like, I love not needing to show my face and not needing to talk. So that's partially personality issues, but I think having a balance, you know, having some contact time and then some things that are left online, like readings would be probably a better mixture for students with different 
methods of learning and living. Yeah, I, uh, I also like Zoom better and you can al always record it. So the students who are not in your time zone can see it and, uh, you know, interact in other ways on, you know, a forum you might have on uh, Moodle or on your, you know, LMS, whatever LMS you're using. So I mean, I, cause I read a lot about advice that's being given. I know Jason does too, that we read a lot about the advice that people, that experts are giving on online teaching. And almost all of them say go asynchronous. And I think it's not the right way to go. I think a combination's the way to go. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just curious, you know, and you're confirming it, Sharon, because, you know, uh, all these experts are saying, oh, students prefer asynchronous. They don't really want to. They can interact only on, the, on a chat forum after they've looked at your lecture. They don't need you there, blah, blah, blah. I don't think it's true. I think it's better to have the live lecture on Zoom than to have the Panopto recording, honestly. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I feel like also for, um, especially here in California, where we are in the middle of this huge crisis, which you guys had, are still, but you had yours started longer ago. Um, just being able to meet with each other and see each other again after being, you know, not in class anymore is, is nice for them. It gives them structure. Yeah. So, yeah. Because we started out, you know, it, with um, in-person meetings, obviously, mm -hmm. and then we switched rather abruptly <laughs> to online. <laughs> Sorry, before I like go, because I have to leave in like two minutes, I just want to very briefly respond to some of the chat comments, just like to, so one thing on like bombarding students with too many messages, um, that is actually could be true because I do have one class and that class has like, A bit too much. So I do think it would help for professors perhaps to like, oh, my internet connection is not stable. Right. So for, for, for students to, um, I realize like if there is an internet connection problem, sometimes it's best to stop until that notification fades before continuing. Anyway, sorry, returning back. It is, I think, perhaps better if professors like tell themselves that, oh, I will only email at a certain time and I'll do all these announcements at once and make it like very clear as opposed to like emailing randomly. Mm -hmm. So definitely like one long message once a week, then like, mm -hmm. like multiple emails that, you know, it's like, if we get that for every single class, it's like insane. Um, so, and then responding to Grace, actually like in the beginning, I have one class that does regular breakup, breakout sessions, breakups, sorry, breakout sessions, like every, um, like week, sort of, uh, sorry, sorry, for every class at the end. I think that it's helpful to have like some lectures and then do a breakout session for discussion. And I have to say in the, in the beginning, all of us were like, this is such a terrible idea. Like I remember in the first breakout session, we were like, what are we doing? Like, this is so dumb. And I, and I think perhaps this is us being like immature. So judge first before we accept, you know, a change. But then, you know, we've done it now for like three or four classes. So this was a new thing that was added and like, literally just last week I told the professor because she would join our breakout breakout sessions um I keep saying break up because I all, sort of like broke up with someone recently so it's like psychological anyway it's like if you slip into the to the breakout session you can like interact with us individually and it makes it feel you know makes us feel better about probably like like groups of four as of a group of like 40 people um and I think oh, there's like one thing yes um, I was also asking, like, I, one suggestion I was thinking about doing, my quarter has, is just starting this week, is putting students into a group for the entirety of the um, quarter. So not into breakout rooms, that could be just different groups, you know, as a way to create a kind of smaller sense of accountability to each other, you know, for the entirety of the quarter. That was kind of my question, too. That was actually my question. Yeah. I'm actually, I, I, don't, I wouldn't know, yeah. But mm -hmm. it, it seems like a good idea to sort of impose I guess in a way like impose that people have to stay connected to one or two people I think perhaps mm -hmm. that makes us more accountable as well and it would probably make it easier for you know. guys as well yeah I'm afraid I have to go but um like I think re responding to one thing Jason said about like the idea of stellar student I mean I don't think I'm a stellar student but a stellar student and like other students that's really difficult to say um I you know realize that like 
everyone is really different. And I, I don't think there is a formula here to like, oh, this is how it would be best. But I really think just showing that you care is alone, like the biggest thing that anyone can do at times like this. And again, I just as a student, thank you so much for you guys like doing this because like this already shows that you guys care. And I think that's very important. I'd be happy to, if, you, if there are other questions that come up during this like Zoom hangout for you guys and you want someone to respond, a student, I'd be happy to like answer like an email or like just call another time as well. But I have a class on gender and leadership now, so I should go. Oh, okay, so hey, tell, hi, tell, yeah, tell Stacy we say hello. For yeah, sure. thanks for joining us. And maybe Enjoy we do this class. again. Yeah, maybe we do yeah. this again. We can find a better time for you. And then, because it seems like you're the person everyone wants, wants to talk to right now. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Sharon. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you. Bye. Bye. Um, let's see. Uh, some of the important points I think that Sharon pointed out is, yeah, they want to be communicated with, but they want it to be efficient. Just like when we get communication from our faculty or whatever. Uh, two is the students talk to each other a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, the breakout rooms are useful and it helps them kind of get intimate with it. And Gr Grace, I, I, I think your idea about accountability is really important. Uh, my classes happen to be kind of small this semester. I have a couple of classes that are it's like 12 people. So I'm able to kind of keep them together as a group and get to know each other. But if I had a group of like 50, 60 or something like that, I definitely would think about breaking them into smaller groups too. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, anyone else teaching a large lecture course? Maybe you can speak to that as well. Let me do one thing real fast though. Um, we have a new person, uh, Justin, Justin Chu, are, are you there? Um, hi, thanks for coming. Um, I just didn't want, so one thing let me tell you is we are recording this right now so um, I need uh, if you're okay with being recorded could you uh, could you copy paste this sentence into the chat so that we know that you've also agreed to be recorded For sure. if you do agree thanks yeah okay thank you very much Justin okay we're all set all right so let's keep going um, uh, so Alex and Grace are our newcomers, but Justin, are you also a student? Well, um, I've already graduated, but I've been teaching some uh, some guest lectures in mm -hmm. CUHK right now. Okay. I've just finished my first um, lecture on censorship, and it was a mess. Ah. Like, <laughs> like, like my my PowerPoint is fine. Like everything went well, but um, the video screening and all that. Like I've always been the one who wants to have more like interactivity on, I, I'm more of a performer. Like I cannot perform on, 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 on a screen like that. I'm not a YouTuber or not. Like I'm more of like a, a performer on stage. And, and oh, I- You seem pretty good right now. <laughs> yeah, like seriously, like, but, but if you can't, and most of the students there, I was teaching that, um, that lecture, which, which mostly consists of MA students who are from the gender study um, course at the program. And I was like, wow, like, they don't speak that much. Like they, they don't, not only they don't show their screen, which because it's not compulsory and I want to protect their privacy as well. Like I can't have any interaction at all. Like seriously, like I was, I was screening like cult film from Shaw era, like, like um, from Shaw films, like with um, Yum Yum Shaw and they're very revealing and all that. I usually get a lot of like fish uh, response and it will help me continue with my lectures and see how they are doing but I can't do all that I can't have physical interaction with them which is completely uh, irritating to me like I cannot function well in this sense yes okay yeah anyone want to speak to that I have a question did you try right uh, are you you're using Zoom, right? Yeah, I'm using Zoom, yeah. Did you try the breakout rooms to ha and give them like a discussion question? I Because I'm not that familiar with the whole system, actually. Like I was using, uh, I was trying to use, uh, use a Mentimeter to get some oh. live response. No, no, no. I was like, no. Like like that, I tried it first. I'm usually I use it as a way to, to interact with students or uh, have some like fun questions there, like, or, or even like, with live quizzes and all that. Like, I, I believe there is another platform that I, I forgot the name, like they have like quizzes that you can yeah, press one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like that one, you can just um, ask question whenever you want and you can have some um, MC question pop up on the screen and you have to like uh, respond immediately. Yeah. Can I make I, a suggestion? 
It still yeah. has a polling function. It's not as good as Mentimeter, but that way the right. students have to, don't have to go from screen to screen. Because I did a Mentimeter and another program during one of these like Zoom meetings with somebody else from uh, that was about online education. And I found it so hard to go from Metameter back to Zoom, back to mm -hmm. Metameter. And I had like two devices open. I had my computer, I had my iPad, I had yeah. everything there. It was so confusing and really hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. So I decided when I was teaching that I would only use the polling function in Zoom. So I've been doing polls in Zoom, which work. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not as good. You can't do a word cloud, but they're still much better than going back and forth. And I would never even attempt to do Metameter, Kahoot, Zoom. Plus, if you have clips, you've got to you do the YouTube stuff in there. It's not easy, you know. It's and if you don't have a TA helping you, plus you're in somebody else's class because it's a guest lecture. It, you know, I would advise you to keep it simple. Keep everything within Zoom if possible, and then just then you only have to worry about the clips. Mm. Like like screen screening clips is another problem. Yeah. Like a lot of time they have delays and um like switching from screens to screens is like the time spent is too much and they have a, a huge learning curve in, on that as well like it's not smooth at all it's pretty weird to me even like i i've like i've heard a lot of students complaining about zoom and online teaching and like it's my first time using zoom to, to teach and i understand how how difficult it is yeah. And I've been teach. I've been telling like students from art arts department and all that like, like give your professor and lecturers a break. Like they are learning it at the same time. They are they're new to it and as as you do. And I, I well I, I think like one one thing I was learning during the whole thing. Like I've learned from you guys who who are already using Zoom as a platform. Another person I I I think he did the best in online teaching was Max Wong actually. Like Max Wong from GCIN from um. School of Modern Language and Culture. Like he was a TV presenter, and he, right. yeah, he he knows exactly everything uh, um, about like screen and uh, streaming as well as all like video recording. Like he he was posting like his update like constantly about online teaching on Facebook, and I was so intrigued and I'm so entertained at the same time. Like he pre-record everything. Like I I, I he, like in his class because he teach um. Um, law and creativity, um, like in, in the creative industry, and he doesn't need that much of a interaction, so he re pre-record everything, and he ought like um, like rollers, like rolling screens, and all that things that that coming up, like popping up here, and that is so fascinating. It's like he, he has become a real life like YouTuber and all that. Like I I I stand, but it's too difficult for like normal people like us who who yeah, just. Well, like, I yeah. I hope it doesn't negatively impact Max's research agenda. <laughs> you no, know? he has fun it's doing also it. Also, tenure life faculty, right? You know, it's like there's only so much we got we can do. Mm. You know? I mean, so, I, I'm tenured, but for people who are not tenured, they got to worry about their research too. Okay, so two things about uh, what what Justin just spoke about. Uh, one is. Um, dealing with multiple screens. And I, I agree with Gina that I think it's too hard to ask students to click out of Zoom and then come back. So if you could kind of, um, uh, Gina, maybe if you could explain how to do polls within Zoom and kind of show us right now as a co-host, we could do that. And I think that that would be really helpful. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have the program up, so I'll just okay. talk about it. I won't bring up a screen because okay. I and don't then, have it prepared. I can prepare it for maybe next time. Okay, okay. Uh, so. But Let me just mention number two and then we'll go into how to do those. Okay. So, and then, so number one, how to do polls within zoom and then number two, how to show clips. Okay. And I think, I think this is an important one, especially for those of us who are in film studies or media or whatever. Right. So I'm, I'm going to do, do one right now. And this is important. I'm going to walk everyone through it. Okay. Um, and then Gina, you can explain to us sure. the polling part. Okay. So what, uh, so, the, um, I know you can't see my screen right now, but I'll just explain. So at the bottom of your screen, you have like the main view, right? Where you see all of our faces and it could be speaker view. If it's speaker view, then it's just the person talking in the middle. If it's gallery view, then you see everyone and all their facial recognition, all their facial expressions. So those of you who thumbs up or smile at me right now, I, I see I see you Val, all right? Okay, so then that's what people will see. But then if you click share screen, which I'm doing right now, then they will see, as the center view, something that you want them to see, 
Okay, so what I want you to see is going to be a clip that I'm gonna show right now, but you have the option when you click share screen, at least in the basic version, to click on the, um, the window that you wanna open. So I'm going to have all of you only look at the window that I want you to see, which is going to be a clip from a movie. So I'm going to show you that clip right now. And then when you click that clip, there's two things you can press. There's two options on the bottom, okay? So when you go to the bottom, it'll say share computer sound and also optimize screen share for video clip. So I'm gonna click both of those, okay? So that means that the sound of the clip comes out as well as it's optimized. And I've also done this where I recorded a lecture and I showed a clip and it also got recorded in that. So later on, uh, when people are looking at this, they will see the uh, lecture I record. So give me one second, I need to set this up, okay? Sorry, I'm a bit slow. Um, okay. I'm opening my clip, okay? My clip is open, so now I'm going to share the screen of that clip, I think. <laughs> and there's also another thing, too, like a whiteboard and that kind of thing that you can use. I'm sorry, my computer is loading. So obviously, you want to load all these things and have it ready before class begins. But uh, now my clip is open. Okay, so now I'm going to share it with you. So I share, I click on the clip, and when I choose the windows, I share computer sound and optimize screen for video clip, and now I share. Okay. So now you should be able to see this. Does everyone see the video? So now as it's recording, later on you'll see in the version, you will see the screen in the middle, and then you'll see the side panel of people. So that's just a short free screen from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, so I'm gonna stop that. Okay, and then now we're back to the center. So later on when you look at the recording, you'll see how that worked. Other things you can share, right? So when you click on share screen, Right, you have the option of the others of the different things another thing you can do is you can click on other things right so now I'll, sh I'll share a whiteboard and then on the whiteboard everyone can draw everyone can write on it right so right now i'm drawing on it and you all see does anyone else want to try anyone else able to write on it or draw on it how do you i think i want to say there's some limitation about whiteboard that mm. i can't remember what it is because yeah, like I, processor or something because oh, I, I can't do it. Yeah, okay. I can't. I can't write on it either. Okay. Well, someone just wrote "click something." <laughs> she hosts maybe. Oh, you mm, click no, something it's... first. Well, oh, someone. How would something. you try to write on it, even if you could? Just can you try to write on it now? I can't. Um, write. Alex, yeah, you're not. talking, but you're muted, so you need to unmute. <laughs> Okay, we got something in the chat. Yeah, it was me. I clicked, you have to click on view options at the top of your screen. Oh. Um, if you're not the host. Uh. And then if you select annotate. Awesome. Then you can do it. Sorry. Oh, look at that. <laughs> got it. But then it disappeared. Oh, there oh. it is. You could erase too. I yeah. love that here. And another thing too is we can save this. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so, well, I, this has uh, to be saved. Yeah. 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 So let's, let's add some stars. I got some stamps here. I want some, I want some hearts in up in here too. Oh, wow. Ooh. Can you just erase your own or others? I don't know, actually. I'm going to, I'm oh. going to erase Valerie right now. Goodbye, Val. Gotcha. <laughs> well, wait, I'm, I can't, I can't erase, I can't erase it all. Wait, oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, I, can. <laughs> I, I missed how to do that. How do you do that? Erase or uh, or draw on it in the first place. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, Alex, can you explain again? Sorry. Uh, just, just a second. You go to view options. It's on the top oh, of my computer yeah. screen, but it might be somewhere else if you're using a phone or something. Yeah, yeah. You go to view options at the top of the screen, and then scroll uh, down to annotate, and then you have like a, a menu of different things you can do. Mouse, text, draw, stamp, arrow. Got it. You can change the colors. Ooh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I got it. Nice. All right, cool. So this has been useful for just like everybody writing notes and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And also if you're drawing on the screen. I yeah. Oh, drawing on a screen. Yeah, if you want. Sometimes so I like I, to draw things. Yeah. I'm I I really enjoy doing the mafia game, Jason. Yeah. That you, Suggested, and I'm also yeah. gonna do some other kind of like uh, icebreakery things, mm. possibly with the white whiteboard. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so just yeah, because it okay. really helps. 
Okay, so real fast, let me just answer that, and then I want to go back to Gina. So first, first, let me do. Okay, one, I'm going to clear, save this board. So why don't everyone stamp it? Let's everyone stamp. If you actually, if you go to Spotlight and you click on the arrow in Spotlight and you put an arrow somewhere, then it'll say your name. So if everyone wants to do that, then we can have what? a. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So someone wants what? to spotlight that. Yeah. How did that work? I don't understand how that works. Yeah, it just kind of points out something. So it's like, I want everyone to see this hello. Oh, but it doesn't stay forever. It doesn't stay forever. Uh, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does anyone, before we, I save it, does everyone want to write their name or something? I'll write my name. <laughs> Why are you saving it? <laughs> <laughs> just for, uh, yeah. I don't know. Just for fun. If you want. If you want. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. All right. I'm going to save this now. All right. Okay. Else? Oh, it went away. <laughs> So I think I'm the only one who didn't know. How do you get to whiteboard? Do you see the whiteboard? In oh, it's in when you click share. Share screen. Share oh, screen. I there's see. an option okay. to click whiteboard. Okay. okay. Another thing too is, and there's been some questions about this, is apparently people can come in and hijack your meeting and yeah. share their screen too. What so was up with that? How does that work? <laughs> It's called Zoom bombing, and mm -hmm. I, I think that they need to know about the meeting through someone else, like a third party, and then they can come in. If you don't have your meeting where you have to have like a registration code, or even if you do, if someone gives that registration code to someone else, yeah, yeah. they can join the meeting. Or if you've got like a naughty student, a naughty student can share, because all of us can share our screens. I can share my screen, you right. can share your screen. Oh. So all your students can do that unless you disable it. So Where's the disable button at? I believe it's in the area where you set up the meeting. Oh. And then they have a lot of options when you set up the meeting, like for the co-host, for the polls, mm -hmm. for all this other stuff that you do before you even have the meeting. Before you launch. Yeah. Okay. And okay, then okay. you go through all that. And I haven't explored all those options. So hmm. That seems okay. Okay, so I saved that whiteboard, and so you can download it later if you'd like. I'll put it on the Facebook <laughs> page post as well. All right, um, the second thing that Valerie was saying is icebreakers. Uh, one, one real quick icebreaker I think you can do that also gets everyone talking. Um, uh, Mafia takes too long. It takes like almost like 30 minutes to an hour. You can do two truths and a lie, right? So it's like, okay, so we can, I, I don't want to do that right now because actually we have more practical stuff to get to. But for example, we'd be like, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a student in Dr. So's course. My name, sorry, Val Rally, of course. <laughs> My name is uh, Jason Coe, and I will give you two truths and a lie, and you have to decide which one is true. One, um, I was born in California. Two, um, I was once a professional poker player. Three, my hair fell out when I was uh, only two months old. And then everyone would vote. So which one do you think is a lie? Type right now, number one, number two, or number three. So everyone would, can type in the chat box. Okay. <laughs> I know the answer then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, number three is, <laughs> yeah. So no, my hair, well, I guess my hair actually did fall out when I was a kid, but it, it grew back and now I shave it. Okay, so yeah, and then that's real fast, right? And then everyone would do that. And then everyone would remember, oh, this is the person who cheated on their whatever or didn't, hair fell out. They just start to remember you associate with the story. Okay. All right. So then let's get to Gina. Maybe you could explain how to do the polls and then we'll open up to questions again. All right, Gina, you're up. Yeah. The polls are pretty easy to do, but they're very basic. So you can't do the same kind of polling you would in Metameter or some more advanced program. Uh, what it is, is when you set up the meeting, so you set up your meeting in the website, not here in the app. So you're in the website, you're setting up your meeting and you go to the, toward the bottom of the page, it'll say poll. And then to the uh, right of that, there's a button that says add. So you click the add and then it'll come up with a prompt and you write in the name of your poll and then you can do your questions and then you save that and that'll be poll one, let's say. Let's say you call it poll one or whatever you wanna call it. Uh, you put in as many questions as you like. Now, when the students do that poll, they'll do that group of questions first. So what I made the mistake of when I first did it was, uh, and luckily I did like a practice so that I knew I didn't know this. Uh, you can't stop that poll. So they'll go through all of those questions at one time. 
in order to get them to do it, let's say a poll, you want to do one poll at the beginning, one poll in the middle, one poll at the end of the class, you have to have three different polls. You can't just have one poll for the whole class. So you go through, you could do your separate polls, and then you can come up with that polling function. There'll be a tab on your meeting. You can just click poll when you want to, and then you can do the poll you want, whether it's one, two, or three, in whatever order you want. Uh, and then the results will come up, and then you have the option to show the results whenever you want. So then the students will see the results of the poll. So I've been using that. It's very basic. It's only multiple choice. That's all you've got. You can have either one answer that's like the correct answer, or that, or no, no, there is no correct answer. You can't use it like a quiz. You, you could have either, they can have one option, like let's say you give them a list of five things, they can only choose one, or they can choose as many as they want for the poll, and then you'll see the percentage. So it's only a polling function, although I used to just like a little quiz too, and to see if everyone's following along with what I'm talking about. Uh, and it can be anonymous or it can be, uh, uh, you can see the names of the people who participate. So, so it's pretty good. I think it's easier, even though it's not as elaborate as cahoots for quizzes or Menometer for polling, it's so much easier not to have to go to another program. Because even though I can show my screen just like Jason did, the students will have to go to a separate screen in order to input into the poll and then I'll show it up on the other screen. At least that's what the person who did it before did. And I found it so cumbersome. It was just really tough. Yeah. And a lot of students are doing it on their phone. They have yes. to remember that too. A yes. lot of students are on their phone when they're using Zoom. And that's also part of the issue between synchronous and asynchronous. Yeah. Like, I, I think it's quite clear that synchronous is better and obviously live is the best. Yeah. But at the same time, it's an inclusivity issue. Yeah. Um, a lot of students don't have the bandwidth you know, just, just imagine if I were in a student's house, who knows if that student is sharing that room with their grandparents, if they have enough space, you know, if they have, if they can afford to use that much bandwidth to be on Zoom, et cetera. So these are all issues that come into play. So, you know, every university is gonna have, and especially if they didn't have a choice about this, you know, it wasn't their choice to take this class online, you know? <clears throat> so like many of them maybe wouldn't have done it, you know, and some students have dropped out you know, because they can't do it, especially in like MA programs where they pay for it themselves. So these are all things to think about. Um, so another thing is, uh, let's introduce Caroline. Uh, Caroline, are you ready to talk? Yes, hello. Hi, Caroline. Um, <laughs> how, so Caroline, why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll try the icebreaker, okay? So Caroline, why don't you um, introduce yourself and then give us two truths and a lie, and then we will guess which one is a lie, okay? Okay, oh goodness, I have to think of something good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I can introduce myself. I'm um, Caroline Dingle, and I'm in the Faculty of Science at HKU. I'm a senior lecturer, um, and I've, I actually don't have tons of teaching this semester, so I've been just trying to help our other teachers. I run the environmental science major, so I've been trying to learn what I can and help other teachers with their teaching this semester. Um, okay, two truths. Um, Okay, well, so I- Don't I'm do it in order, mix up the order. I know, so I, 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 know. Yeah. I, might, I need a minute to think of something creative. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I spent one year living in the middle of the Amazon jungle. I am Canadian. I, I love mushrooms. <laughs> okay, one, two, or three, I'm gonna vote. <laughs> okay do you listen to wait wait don't tell me this reminds me of that a little bit <laughs> oh yeah yeah a little bit like wait wait don't tell me i love wait wait don't tell me okay it looks like we've got uh more more votes <laughs> more votes for mushroom which which, which one is it <laughs> that's the lie i hate mushrooms <laughs> oh, really <laughs> I, love, I love mushrooms it's like vegan meat <laughs> anyway all right thanks caroline all right so caroline welcome to the conversation anything you want to add or questions you have you know that you, or discussion topics um or anything you want to speak to that we've already talked about that you can add your kind of insight to yeah i sort of miss some maybe that's one of the issues let's kind of talk what you're talking about i have my my children my child at home um and the challenges of trying to do this with um other people in your household are real, but both from a teacher perspective, or a student perspective and the teacher's perspective, 
Yeah, that's actually something I was hoping to talk about more in this in this meeting. You know, I was hoping we would maybe get a chance to talk with more parents who are homeschooling right now by by force that are forced yeah. to homeschool. Yeah. Wondering, to hear from you, how's it going? What's tough? What's easy? What's doable? What's not doable? You know. Yeah, um, I think we've had. I could bring my son in. He could tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one thing has been the schedule, like scheduling, trying to find. You know, it means I. Well, I spend a significant part of my day with him doing that stuff, which I love on one hand, but it means I'm not, you know, spending as much, I don't have as much bandwidth left over to do the stuff I need to do. Um, so I think we're trying to, I found we had one week where we had a pretty good schedule going. He had, you know, football class and he would go to the neighbor's house for two hours for a bit of a, a section they did together. She ran like an art class. Um, and that was working pretty well, but now recently with the new laws, all that's gone away. So we're starting from scratch again, trying to come up with a schedule. Um, yeah, you want to say hi? <laughs> hi, hello. We better, good job. Hi. <laughs> um, I might actually need to come back in a minute, so maybe I'll come yeah, yeah. back to that. <laughs> okay, okay, sounds good. I'll be back in a minute. Thanks. Okay, great. So we've got a question from Grace. Do you want to ask it? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, this is just a very basic question in terms of like what type of assignment you think work best um, for remote learning. I have no insight on homeschooling. Boy, it is a challenge. That's all I'll have to say. Yeah. I, I really feel for people who are, you know, having so many people in the household who have to be online at the same time and who have to work with their different schedules. I mean, I've had a couple of administrators say, oh, what are you doing with all your spare time now? You know, boy, you must be getting a lot of research. And I said, are you kidding? I mean, I don't even have, you know, I have an adult son, so I don't have like little kids at home. But it's like, my gosh, it's so much harder just to live and to try to keep up with your groceries and keep up with everything, plus doing the courses. And even though I'm just doing, uh, you know, lectures in other folks' classes, it's a lot of extra work to just get that stuff online. So people don't appreciate that this is so disruptive. Uh, I had a, I also had a comment on the assignments. I haven't given any assignments, but I had someone made a comment in a, meet, a Zoom meeting I was in yesterday about what kind of assignments was working for him. And he said he's giving a lot of autobiographical kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So students are asked to comment or try to link course material to what's going on to, in their lives right now. Uh, if you can do that or, or give it as an option. I mean, I would say the fewer changes, the better. I think Sharon was right when she was saying that a lot of her peers really liked the fact that they made no changes in law, <laughs> you know, because the, the sense that there's some continuity, that their expectation, if your assignments were okay before, why not? But I would say for an option, not only, I don't know if your, your university's gone to pass fail, but a lot of Ours has gone for pass-fail options for all courses. So pass-fail option, and then with pass-fail, maybe a reduction in workload. So you can do a little bit less to pass if you're on that option. And then also I would say, uh, give the students who wanna just go through with what they expected as much as possible. I mean, some of those assignments they might not be able to do, particularly for labs, like Caroline would know. I mean, she's with science. So. I think some things they cannot do. There are some assignments that they literally cannot do now. But if they can do the same assignments, give them that option. And if they can't, give them an option where they can do something maybe more creative or something with what's going on in their life or more autobiographical. I thought that made a lot of sense when this guy said it yesterday. Can I ask a follow-up, actually? Um, do you think students are interested in learning and reflecting about the pandemic now, or is there just not enough distance? I mean, are they just over, you know what I mean? I feel like I'm overloaded. Do, would I want to do that in class, too? I mean, of course, that's not what an autobiographical assignment needs to be, but I do have one week. I mean, since we are, have crafted our syllabi with remote learning in mind, I mean, I'm not continuing a class. I'm starting up a new yeah. quarter, you know, so I have a week on pandemics, but I was like, hmm, I think I better poll and see, do they even want to be discussing this, you know, or not? Yeah. I think, I think they do. Very, yeah. I think some students will really want to. I mean, I'm one of those people, I really want to. That's all I really want to talk about. When something's happening, I'm that kind of person. It's like, you know, I just read Severance, the book Severance. I don't know if you know that book by mm -hmm. Ma Lang. 
boy, is that a good book. And it's exactly about what we're going through, you know? Yeah. And it's all, you know, it's like I, I'm underlining the stuff that she's writing about that's happening right now with border closures and that sort of stuff and the, you know, the Shen fever as, and the Wuhan virus kind of stuff. And I'm also thinking about like what she's not doing that I'm seeing happening right now. Like she doesn't say a word about racism, you know? And it's like, whoa, racism is such a huge part of what's going on right now. So, I mean, for me, I'm that kind of person. Mm -hmm. But I agree that some students might want to just, you know, if we were supposed to read Huckleberry Finn, let's just read Huckleberry Finn and just, you know, deal with that, you know, whatever it was. Um, but I think that maybe options, like I'm thinking flexibility is so important now for the students, give them options. If they want to talk, give them a chance to talk. If they don't want to talk about it, give them an assignment where they don't have to think about it. So. Val, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, I think I might have said this the last meeting, but since Grace wasn't there, I'm going to repeat it for you, Grace. Um, that uh, I found what we were told to do is to focus on your learn what we call our student learning outcomes, right? Like, what is it you want them to get out of the class, as opposed to like making them do like all these little teeny assignments that you usually do <laughs> in a regular term, right? So paring it down more to how you can get them to what learning goals you have for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Valerie yeah. said earlier, like just give them the option of doing like one paper, you know? <laughs> You know, carrying yeah. it down, I think, is so true. I think a lot of them are going to need to really just concentrate your right on the bare minimum. Yeah, I mean, and, and us too. I mean, we we have to, like, give ourselves a break too because we're going through it as well, right? So, I mean, again, you folks in Hong Kong have been doing it for a long time now. So maybe you're a little bit more in the rhythm of it. <laughs> or no, it doesn't ever, never get in the rhythm. Of it. Yeah, it's, it's, there's always something, right? <laughs> I just worry though that one big paper at the end allows like a student to just I mean I'm thinking it's to fine, just like check but out just to, yeah check out yeah. and then it's really hard to yeah. pass that's what do you, do you have um what online platform are you did your school use yeah. yeah do you are you on Blackboard or Moodle or what is Can, it? Canvas yeah Canvas okay uh, uh, probably similar yeah. so one thing that I do is or I have done and I think other people do is they give like a little very brief thing like I assigned a film to watch this like 15 minutes and then I give them a series of open-ended questions that relate to whatever the topic is that we're thinking about and I think I, I can't remember if it was I think it was this particular group that I posted my questions but I can't, can't remember because I've been in like so many zoom meetings I can't focus anymore <laughs> I can send it to you though Grace if you want you know so you just ask things like you know how does this thing relate to whatever, you know, your topic is, or explain three ways, you know, it's like writing like exam questions, like a prompt, right? And then they post in the forum. Mm -hmm. And then they also have to reply to at least one other person in the class on the forum. And they also have to write a minimum of 15 to 20 words in their post. So they can't just say, I agree, or that was good, right? So, and they usually are good about it. But I, yeah, yeah. Um, Grace, uh one thing that's kind of different for you maybe than for us is that your quarter is just starting right now. So you, the students who choose to join your course, you know, um, they have that in mind already. So you can set those expectations right from the outset. But for us, um, you know, we were expecting it to be a certain type of class and then we had to switch midstream. So I think that a lot of the students, you know, probably would not have signed up for my course if they had known it would all be online or something like that. Yeah. You know, and it, they, they extended the ad drop period so that students had options to see the different ways that different teachers were going to do the online work. Um, I tried to make it more online friendly, but then, you know, by having some, some recorded lectures and that kind of thing so they could just click through, but, you know, it, it depends. One thing that I will say is um, I decided from the beginning, I know that some people have decided to give everyone A's and I'm not opposed to that, <laughs> but one thing that I think is unfair is I think that some students like, for example, like Sharon, right? They want an A and they want to earn it and they want to work hard for it. And I want to give them that room to do that too. So I've tried to make it so that there's like, 
a slacker route to a passing grade and like a hard working route to an A. And they'll all be around the same, but the student will learn, get as much as out of the, as they want and the mm -hmm. others will not. And so every, I try to make everything optional. And then when it comes to assignments, I give, I give real writing assignments. So I say to the student, if you want to write like a real research paper, I'm here to support you if you want to do that. And I actually recorded a, um, a uh, writing lecture too. So you can share this with your students as well if you want so that they, cause usually I give like writing tips in class. So, this, so I just recorded this for all my classes so that you can share this with them too if you want. Um, so that they know how to write because the way I see it too is I told them like, look, you're quarantined, I'm quarantined. Now you can take this as like, oh, this sucks. Or you can be like, hey, I can use this as a chance to get really good at writing. So if you want to do that, here are the resources for you. And I promise them, I'm actually, I decided, I made an agreement. I'm like, I'm not going to meet with you for two weeks. I'm going to spend this time grading and I'm going to try to do a really good job of grading so that this other form of teaching can kind of come through. And if you want to perform in this area, that's fine. But I'm also giving people options to do experiential learning kind of reflection. So it's like, how has this experience worked with you? And I think what you said, starting with polls is really important. That's what I did. So from the beginning, I said, what would be the best way for you to learn? And, you know, obviously you get mixed answers. You know, and obviously they don't really know what's best for them because it's new to them too. But because you pull them, you get buy-in. They're willing to be test subjects in this new form of online pedagogy. So I said, okay, everyone agreed to recording lectures, so let's try that. Okay, those of you who agreed to this, let's try that, right? And I give them options on their assignments too. And it's not that hard for me to grade an essay versus a reflection versus a, you know, like a creative project. I can do all three, no big deal. So it's kind of like give students different ways to perform you know, and just kind of go with that and give them those options. And, you know, some of them really have kind of, I don't know, dug in, leaned in, you know, and they're like, um, you know, I really want to push myself and try to write a really, really good research paper. And I've sort of encouraged some of them to say like, hey, you know, those of you who want to go to grad school or something, take this opportunity. I will work with you. You will get more of me than you normally would in order to kind of really develop your writing if you want to put that work in. At the same time, though, much harder. Online, online teaching way harder, online engagement way harder, you know, so just take that all into account. The easier you make it for them, maybe the easier you make it for yourself too, but then how much room do you want to give them to grow? And that's kind of up to you too. Is that, I hope that helps. Okay, okay um, so uh, let's welcome our next, um, our, 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 our new guest, uh, Dr. Fiona Law. Um, so uh, welcome Fiona, feel free to talk to us you know, through video chat or chat in the chat box, it's up to you. Um, Fiona, when you get a chance, could you please copy paste the I agree to be recorded and have this recording posted publicly for the benefit of others in the everyone chat so that everyone sees and then I have a recording of that. And if you want to join us and talk, that's cool. If you just want to hang out, that's cool too. Okay. All right. So Grace has got to run. So thanks, Grace. We'll catch you later. Bye, Grace. Bye. Okay. So uh, Fiona, do you want to introduce yourself? If you do, it's okay if you don't. Sorry, by the way, for the changing backgrounds. I finally figured out how to do it. <laughs> I think they're beautiful. I know. They're like, don't you want to be there? Yeah. It's quite bright behind me, so I, um, I realized that was a bit distracting, probably. Okay. Uh, so Fiona cannot uh, turn on her mic, right? Because everyone has different situations. Totally understandable. So that's cool. So Fiona is hanging out with us. Okay. All right. So other questions, thoughts, concerns, things you want to address? Anyone? I'll say something, sorry. Uh, well, first of all, sorry, I had to run before. That kind of, uh, we can go back to that conversation later if we want to, the challenges of children at home. So uh, my son has made an appearance on almost every single one of my lectures and video calls <laughs> at some point. Um, but actually what I was gonna say is kind of related to the teaching. So I've done a few lectures on Zoom, but my part is done for the semester. But I have been interacting with my project students a lot on Zoom and also just with the major students. I've tried to have sort of open office hours. And I think this is a, a something Stacy mentioned last time we met as well. But it's, I really feel like the students appreciate it so much. Like even it's an email to ask them how they're doing. Um, I get these responses and they're very grateful that someone is checking in on them and asking how they're doing. And it's such a simple thing to, I mean, obviously it's hard if you have a class of 300 people, you're not going to email everybody privately, but, um, you know, whenever I've had the opportunity at the end of, if a student writes me an email, asks me a question at the end, I just ask a question, how are you doing? Are you coping okay? And, and almost always they respond to me, which is 
uh, unusual. <laughs> um, so I think, I think it doesn't take much to just show the students that you're caring, you're, you're aware of the situ that the situation is weird and that you care that they're trying to deal with that as best they can. Okay, great. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question I wanna put out to everyone. Um, and this is from a colleague and um, this colleague w could not join us, but uh, this, uh, they had a question. And the question, actually two questions, I guess one is, um, is it habitual for all participants to turn on their cameras? I read about the way Zoom collects and uses personal data and find it a bit worrying myself. So what's the usual practice in HK or among the colleagues? And then a second follow-up question um, is, I would like to know the perspectives of our colleagues regarding the privacy of the students and also the collection of data by Zoom. Are they worried? Have their students express, expressed any concerns? Okay, all right. And you know, obviously this links to our situation in Hong Kong. We're worried about academic freedom, worried about you know, conversations being recorded, especially if Zoom has any connection to the state or which state, <laughs> I guess. You know? So maybe that's something we could, we could talk about. And I'll just start with saying, I, I make all the Zoom meetings optional. So I tell the students, if you wanna come, welcome. Um, I will record what people are okay with recording, but I won't necessarily record everything. But it's optional, it does not affect your participation grade. Now, if they had all signed on to that agreement at the beginning of the semester, then I think the story would be different. Um, and that's something I'll leave admin to worry about. But you know, these other issues of privacy, you know, and you know, is a concern. So does anyone wanna to speak to that? I think that uh, what the last lecture I gave, not a single student turned on his or her camera. Mm -hmm. So they were all completely there. Now they're not anonymous. I can see their names are there. Uh, and then when they went into their discussion rooms, their uh, you know breakout rooms, they clearly were chatting. Uh, but everything else they preferred to do on the chat, on the texting. So they did text me. Uh, so I knew they were there. Uh, I know that Justin said that that made him uncomfortable, but I found it okay because I also agree with you. I think some of our students, even though this particular lecture, I'm going to see how things are going like next week, you two know, uh, Alvin and, and Jason, I'm going to be giving a lecture on protest culture in their classes. So that's a more sensitive topic. So I'm going to make it even, you know, easier for students not to show their faces mm -hmm. and not participate if they don't want to. Uh, for that very reason, because yeah, indeed, you know, I don't know who's watching this. I have no clue. You're recording it. It's going to maybe go up on Facebook or wherever. Uh, I don't know. I also don't know. I, everything goes into the cloud. So even if you don't hit record, you don't know what's going into the cloud because that option's always there for the company. So I have no clue about the company practice or what have you. I feel though we're such small fish and there's such a big ocean out there. I'm not that worried, but you know, what can I say? I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not in that league where anybody would really worry about me, but other people may have other concerns or might have family connections they might be concerned about. But I think there's enough options out there for people. I agree with Jason, there's enough options for people to kind of avoid having their names associated with a particular meeting or their faces mm. associated with a particular meeting. So I think that's an important thing. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit worried for myself that I am not respecting people's privacy enough. So that's why I'm asking you all to paste and say that you agree to be recorded. You know, um, originally my mindset was try to make it as open source as possible because everyone is kind of drowning right now and we all need as many life rafts and life vests out there. You know, and if a student in another course or a teacher in another place, you know, can use a video and it will help them, then I want to do that. At the same time, I think it's, it is important to respect privacy, especially in Hong Kong, right, where we're worried about certain things like doxing or whatever, you know, yeah. and things like protests. So I, I'm trying to think about my protocol about how to do this. One thing I've thought about is um, when I do classes on Zoom, what I can do maybe is when I do the lecture, I just tell everyone to turn off their camera and then um, only record the share screen. Um, and also, you know, students can change their names too, right? Like many of you have already changed your names. Like um, you can change your name on that and then just kind of make people aware of that. And that, that's the best I can do right now, but I'm sure more protocols will come into place. And, you know, 
universities, governments all need to step in, I think, and talk and work it out with these companies about what's allowable, what's okay, what's not okay. Because even the university conducts tons of surveillance or can as capable through the learning management systems like LMS or whatever. They can see how many times a student clicks on a certain link right through the LMS. So there's a lot of kind of surveillance that's already happening. So it's kind of being aware of that, I think. And I, I'd like to think using it to our advantage, using yeah. it to the things in the interest that matter towards us. But at the same time, I think it's an open question and I can understand why the students wouldn't necessarily trust me as an authority figure with control over that data. So I, I'm, I'm trying to be as respectful as possible about that. But I've also heard other people talk about how like things like in language classes, you need to have the students turn on their camera because you need to see that they're pronouncing the words correctly. And I can understand that too. So it's, yeah. but I think that's I like. Think, yeah, for the language classes, that's when the students, when they had the option to drop, because mm. we have to like drop, they should have dropped if that yeah. was an issue. Because yeah. yeah, sometimes you have to do it. And the way the companies market all of the surveillance uh, these surveillance options to us is for the teachers. It's for us to know, oh, this part of your lecture is really working because students are clicking on it more than that part or what have you. It's really supposedly for our benefit. <laughs> so you have to understand the fact that, yeah, this surveillance mechanism is built into almost any LMS system. And it's there for us, even if we don't want it or if we're more concerned about privacy <laughs> than you know what they have there. The same is going to be happening for we. I went to a lecture uh, done by our learning uh, team on testing. And if you think surveillance is a problem in Zoom, look at some of this testing software, believe me. Whoa, <laughs> there's heavy duty surveillance going on. What do you mean, test, what's testing software? What, do you, what is testing software? Uh, this is the software that they use for like large, it, to take the place of what would be a large, uh, uh, monitor test, so proctored test. Oh, so this is software that can proctor your student. So they wow. have off a lot of. You have to have the camera on. They have people watching. It's like a panopticon. They have people who will go and like watch, and you pay the company to do this for you. Wow, uh, that's yeah. nuts. A that's lot crazy. Of, it's crazy, but th these companies are out there, and they I'm are sure. have super predatory because oh, they, this is the time to get the institutions hooked so that they don't have to give these big proctored exams anymore. Yeah, and, and actually, costs. Yeah. Speaking, the costs and it's gonna speaking save of the, a ton yeah. of money. I mean, it's like, okay, yeah. this is like where, you know, it's- No um, more graduate assistants. Just yeah, get the, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's taking advantage of the crisis. It's Naomi Klein's book, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that is a concern that a lot of people are worried about here is like, how is how are the, the universities um, going to like use this to further exploit faculty <laughs> down the line? It's like, oh, you guys know how to do online classes. Yeah. You know, or, oh, we own your intellectual property because you uploaded it to our platform. So, yeah, it's really sure tricky. Yeah, you got to be sure. careful. Yeah, for sure they do. I mean, anything mm -hmm. you feel you don't want to have the world know about, don't teach it. <laughs> because it's going to happen. Uh, it's the yeah. set, you know, it's it's like that. I mean, they do own what you do in a certain respect. So no, you don't own your lectures. No, your university does. And how they use it, however they want to use it, they will use it that way. So you know, you d you don't have a really a legal leg to stand on, even though some people feel they do it, do or they should. They don't. So if you have something that you feel like is copyrighted material or something you haven't published yet, don't share it necessarily with your class until you feel like you've got enough of your own, you know, ownership of the idea or whatever it is before you. Yeah, I'm sure. Th I'm sure we've all signed away our intellectual property rights somewhere without oh, yeah, even thinking about sure. it. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's just you know, forget it. Plus, do you really yeah. have the legal clout to go after your institution or go after a, even more? the legal team you'd need to go after one of the learning management companies. <laughs> oh my gosh. You feel like you really can do that? No. I, I, and you're a person who's happen. been doing a MOOC too. So you know all about that. Yeah. So the MOOC, everything on my MOOC, a hundred percent free open. But you know, the thing is that's really bugging me is the company's constantly putting up paywalls that I never gave them permission to put up. 
which is really pissing me off because all I do is spend my time figuring out ways around their damn paywalls, which, I've, which I'm doing, by the way. I'll tell you about that later, Valerie. I'll send you an email about that. <laughs> it's amazing, you know? Okay, hey, great. Um, we have a question from Alex. Um, Alex, do you want to give us your question? And one more thing too is, uh, I don't know if you all want to try it, but there's this thing called, um, you can raise your hand. <laughs> so if you go into your manage participants, if you click participants, right, there's an option to mute and there's an option to raise your hand. And then so when, yeah, Justin just raised his hand and I can lower your hand. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll get to it eventually. So, all right, cool. So Alex, you're up. Go for it. Um, Hi, everyone. Yeah, my question is just dealing with the less motivated students, because obviously we had a really excellent student now who is uh, earlier, who's really um, interested and engaged. But with the students who are really uh, more struggling, how do we keep tabs on them? Uh, and um, how do you kind of chase up, chase them up? Obviously, I'm not suggesting you become very dictatorial, but um, any ways of doing that? Alex, can I ask you, how do you usually do it in when classes are live and students stop coming to class and that kind of thing? Um, well, okay, in Japan, it's, it's kind of, there's a bit of cultural differences. So students really always turn up to class, almost always. You'll get one or two, you get very rare um, maybe four or five students in an entire 200 year group that that you have to if the, the, the department has to kind of look into uh, almost always they give you the work on time mm. it's, it's surreal you, you don't really spend much time um, chasing up deadlines now they may not do that work you know with great diligence but they will always give you something mm. so um, it's not it's not so much a, a a concern in japan i don't really understand why but i i'm just i'm concerned about knowing the difference you know understanding exactly where student what well, obviously the kinds of challenges that you've said like a lot of students will be dealing with genuine problems and how exactly to gauge that because it, it seems like a minefield to me and and like you're pointing out too probably a cultural minefield as well yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, this is one of the situations where I really think there's no one size fits all kind of kind mm -hmm. of thing to deal with. You know, um, I think you need to trust your intuition as a teacher. And it sounds like you're an excellent teacher. So, you know, you know what it takes, you know, in the fact that you even asked this question means that you're worried about it in some way. You know, I, I don't know. Th this is always tough. Any anyone else have any thoughts on this? Uh, I can say something. Um, usually in my classes, I have some kind of attendance policy and I wonder if um, if the attendance turns out so well for Alex is also maybe your institution, Meiji, you already has a strict attendance policy or something like that. Um, when I used to teach at Yonsei in South Korea, most of my students turn up to attendance, but I always do have something like if you miss more than three classes, then the 10% of your attendance grade will be really bad or you might lose all of it. Um, for my classes at uh, Camp Lit, I used to have no attendance policy for lecture because that seems to be the norm in a, on a lot of syllabus when I look through my colleagues. But then I started seeing a lot of students like sort of miss more classes after the midterm. Mm -hmm. And I do want them to try to make an effort to come. So I then assign 5% for my lecture and then the 10% for tutorial. But now everything goes online. It's very hard to schedule like individual tutorial session. It's kind of like this discussion session for the US um, universities. So I just combine uh, sort, of, sort of lecture and tutorial um, in the usual uh, Friday classes that runs for two hours. So what I do is um, if I have like nine or 10 Zoom meeting for the rest of the semester, I ask my students to at least attend five of them in order to um, get a good grade on the 15% for the attendance and tutorial grade. And then if they cannot make one or two of them, then they can write a response paper, like a one page response paper for the reading of that week to make it up. Uh, so I, I guess I have a kind of attendance policy kind of in the middle range of what Jason does of sort of 
you know, um, voluntary um, attendance for Zoom versus like a really strict one. I sort of give some flexibility for the students who can make it up. And also um, because of the, um, our institution have this late drop, uh, sort of late add and, you know, uh, switch to pass and no pass policy, which gives flexibility to students. I also have one or two students who just returned from Europe because they can, there's not much of a chance that they can finish their study abroad semester. So they are adding courses late. So I have at least two of those students, one for my large lecture and one for my feminism course. So for them, they definitely need flexibility in terms of catching up to deadlines. So I give, I also give sort of extended deadlines for previous assignments. Thanks, uh, just one quick technical question. So if you're the host in Zoom, you get a list of participants. So that is a kind of attendance list, but does it tell you whether they've attended the entire class? Because I could imagine if you do breakout rooms and that kind of thing, it's difficult to monitor. Is there any way of monitoring that? Yeah, they'll, they'll tell you when someone leaves the meeting. Okay. So you can't really monitor, like if I turn off my camera, I mute it, and then I go off do something else, you can't tell whether I'm physically here or not. Mm -hmm. But the student has to really think through that whole process but if they physically leave the meeting, in other words, if they click leave the meeting, you'll have a record when they go. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of being inclusive in this situation. Um, you know, you have students who are traveling. I have students uh, who are from mainland China and now they've moved back and some of them are being in quarantine or in their hotel. And, you know, first of all, they cannot get onto our LMS. Right, they need to have a VPN. And then secondly, their internet is really spotty, especially if they're quarantined in a hotel. So even though I upload things to like YouTube where they can download and watch the clip, even that's not usable. They definitely cannot get on Zoom. So these, you really have to account for this. Um, and I think being in touch with your students about that situation is an important thing too. But you know, like this is, it's not super new, right? Like, you know, people in like Iowa or whatever, you know, during certain months of the year, they need to worry about their students who have to work out on the farm with their parents, you know? So it's like, you, you do need to think about every kind of situation. Um, yeah, and be, be flexible if you can, at least now, right now, because right now we're in crisis. But once, once things get to normalize and crisis becomes the state of exception, <laughs> then maybe come up with better, you know, protocols that might work for you and engage with your students. I think polling is a big deal, but, you know, students also cannot, some, some subaltern cannot speak, right? There are some students who really cannot even respond to your questions. Yeah. Okay, cool. Other, other thoughts? Anything you else want to discuss? Yeah, I, I have a prediction. I think that we're going to be asked to just build in this as part of a component of almost all our classes in the future. So that we'll be doing parallel classes. I think one so. For people who are going to have to do the e, you know, the e-learning option and one for people who are going to be physically with us. Yeah. And that I think that's going to be an expectation. That's where, you know, Valerie was talking about work speed up. I think that's where we're going to see work speed up in the future. And I can, un I can understand the resistance to that too. Um, and what, one thing that I think I predict for Hong Kong, and I, I think we're already seeing this because Hong Kong is like a laboratory for a lot of different things. So a lot of things happen first in Hong Kong and then they kind of reverberate around the world. Um, you know, so one thing we're already seeing in Hong Kong is we're having a second wave. And so we, we, yeah. we, were, we were out of class and then we kind of flattened the curve. And they're like, okay, we can be more social again, try to move back into it. And then suddenly it's like, no, boom, we have a second wave. We need to go back to social distancing again. So my sense is that this is gonna be a recurring thing. If you think about like mm -hmm. tides and waves, right? If an epidemic mm -hmm. happens in waves, then we're gonna get waves over and over again. So I foresee that management and administrators will create a sort of like a contingency plan every semester from now on. So it'll be a bit like we have with the typhoons here. So those of you who are not familiar, in Hong Kong, we have typhoon systems. So there's like typhoon number, you know, system five, <laughs> system eight. When it's typhoon number eight, everyone has to stay home. When it's five, only necessary services. You know, when it's three, then you can still go to school. So there will be times when it's epidemic level eight where everything gets moved online again. So I think that that's just going to be part of the ways that Hong Kong navigates this constant. And Hong Kong is much more open than other places in a lot of ways. So we may hit a lot of waves more often than other places, just like other weather systems or natural phenomena that are politi political still. <laughs> Typhoons are political too, right? So, you know, I think that 
learning how to adjust and go back and forth will be a part of teaching in the future for better or worse. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah. Caroline, did you have something to say? I'm afraid I cut you off a little bit. Oh, no, I don't think I was saying anything. Okay. But Just your yeah, yellow box I, I, lit up. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Yeah. I probably made a noise. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing I, in some ways this is good because I was very resistant to recording my lectures before. Like our university has been pushing for us to record lectures for a long time and I have never done it. Um, and now I feel like if I had to, I'd feel more comfortable about it at least. So that's something that's good. Um, and I think there's certain advantages. I mean, it's certainly nice to be able to give a lecture from home or wherever you are, that might be some freeing. But I really, really, really miss the student interaction in classrooms. I don't know. I, I think these sessions are really helping to try to find ways to interact with students more, but um, it's something that you just don't get. I don't feel like I've managed to get, especially because I mostly teach bigger classes yeah. um, through the online system. And I miss, you know, I, I feel like when you're in the classroom, there's just an opportunity to bump into students or uh, there's much more chance for them to come up to you and ask a question or interact in some way. And I find that difficult. So I guess if we, if this is something that's going to continue, uh, we should keep having these discussions and finding ways to yeah, have that kind of interaction. Absolutely. Online. Absolutely. Community, we share tips, we learn more. But yeah, I know I agree with you too. The affect is totally different, you know. Um, but one thing that is interesting though is that um, online can also be very intimate. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously what we're doing right now is very intimate. Like I've been looking at all one, two, three, four, five, six, six of your faces this entire time, reading your reactions, you know, whereas, you know, obviously you do that in electric hall too, but there's something about, you know, the zoom with the zoom in and that kind of thing and the chat and all this kind of stuff. It's pretty immersive too. And I feel that time goes pretty fast. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go. So bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. 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 Bye Alex. Okay. Thanks Alex. Bye. Okay. And then there were six. So, <laughs> Uh, anything else you want to talk about? Oh, I have a question or, 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 or a idea, actually. Uh, some of the um, lecturers actually recorded their, their lectures and then they put it on YouTube. And afterwards, they instead, um, like, asking students to comment whatnot, they will have a Telegram group or WhatsApp group, like, if for, for smaller classes. Like, most of the class in GCIN, for example, it's not, like, I mean, for the elective courses, they are not like 100 students, they are like 30 to 60 max. And some of the lecturers have um, taken to that route of um, setting up a WhatsApp group or a Telegram group, which helps to protect um, students' autonomy um, compared to WhatsApp because you need their uh, phone number, right? So um, they tend to use this kind of um, way to like enhance that um, like communication for, for, for like, towards students and all and all. Like what's your comments on that? Like because some of the students are quite worried about that because the because it's quite intimate. Like they are tech, like some of the lecturers is actually texting you, and some of them loves it. Like like there's it's so polared. Like in 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 the student that I met, like some of them they are afraid of um, the lecturers knowing like, like like where they are and whatnot. And some of them are like they are so into like asking questions to the lecturers and and that. Like what are your comments on on this matter? Um, I guess I can speak to that first. Um, my, my recommendation for any student and really any teacher, you know, is boundaries, know your boundaries. Uh, and you don't have to protect them per se, but you have to define them yourself and be clear with that. And some students, they like being closer. Some cl students prefer being farther. As a teacher, I think that I need to be very clear about my boundaries. You know, like I have personal time, I have personal space. I don't like to WhatsApp with students. I don't like to WhatsApp with colleagues. If colleagues WhatsApp me, it's because we're hanging out and talking socially. You know, um, at the same time, I think students need to start being more clear about this because students before had a very clear boundary. I only see my teacher in class and that's it. But now it's like, I see my teacher over email. I see my teacher over this. So they also need to be very clear about their boundaries and that will help them <laughs> not just in school, but everywhere, especially as our world becomes more online and they deal with more surveillance technology and that kind of thing. So knowing your boundaries and being clear about it is the way to go. You know, and I think teachers, we need to be like, hey, some of you who are cool with WhatsApp, let's use it. Some of you who are not cool with it, that's okay. And there needs, but there needs to be set things that everyone knows is like open 
for all. Like for me, it's email and then the forms on the learning management system. So I make sure the students like you all have access to this forum and I make them all respond at least once. So I know for sure that they can use it. Once I know that, then I'm saying like, that's, that's the zone. Anything outside of that, that's up to them to whether or not they want to move into that boundary, uh, past that boundary. And I give them that freedom, but also I'm very clear about my boundaries as well. I think that'll help, you know, whether that's with this or romantic relationships or Ill relations with your family too. <laughs> okay, cool. Anyone, anything else anyone wants to discuss? I would just add to that, like one thing I found a big challenge is setting those boundaries for myself. Because when you're working at home, work and you know, my son was here earlier, it's all meshing into one, is work and family and trying to manage his homeschooling. And it's very confusing for him that I'm home all the time, but I'm ignoring him a lot of the time that I'm home. He likes me here, but you know, he doesn't understand why I won't respond all the way. And so yeah, trying to find my own boundaries so I don't work all the time um, and so because I find myself getting frustrated with him sometimes because you know he comes and interrupts but he can't tell what I'm you know he just sees me talking to the computer I could be doing anything um, and unfortunately the room that I have set up is an office where I can shut my door when I thought that was very clever um, my internet doesn't reach up there <laughs> so I'm like in the middle of the house really when I'm doing these things um, so that's yeah so going along with that with the students like also knowing being clear what my boundaries are and actually maybe more to the point is I've actually thought very carefully about when I respond to students because I've been having a bit of insomnia sometimes I wake up at like two in the morning and I, so I'm like well I'm up I'll do a little work while it's quiet but I actually stopped I write the email sometimes but I don't send them because the students know <laughs> when you sent them and so I kind of try to do all that within a normal working hours so you're conveying that message message in your actions as well Google has, Gmail has like a new schedule send. So I use that all the time. So I answer emails at like four in the morning, but I'll schedule send it at like 8 a.m. on Monday. So yeah. like it's, it gets sent at 8 a.m. And then everyone will be like, oh yeah, Jason answers emails at 8 a.m. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm awake. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. I like that one. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions or feedback? Or... Okay, should we wrap up then? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. I really appreciate you joining us for this online hangout. Uh, I think we touched on a lot of stuff. Any kind of closing thoughts? Anyone else want to share anything before we wrap up? No? Okay. All right. Thanks. Every yeah. Thanks everyone for your time. Um, you know, let me know if you want to do this again. I'll, I'll post this on YouTube and I'll post it on Facebook. Please do share this with everyone who might find it useful. And, you know, if we do this again, collect questions from your colleagues about what what they need help with. I would really like to do more on, I think this week we got some feedback from students. More students would be better, but also more working parents from home and kind of tips we can give them. Caroline, I think you started off with some good stuff about scheduling and boundaries. You know, and so like maybe the more we think about that, we can come up with more tips to share with, with other people in the future. Okay. They also demonstrated some of the challenges. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> life course, interruptions. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I was thinking too, it's like, if the, if the university really wants, if the universities really want us to be able to switch back and forth between online, then they need to give us free internet access. They need to give us new computers. They need to give the students computers and telecommunications abilities, because yeah. if it becomes a utility, well, then they need to provide for it. Okay, and then maybe we work with them on that. And then maybe that's a good starting point for our, our new agenda in this brave new world. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop recording now. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.